Uh, let me start. I'll do a little. Re I'll, I'll read you a couple of introductions. Corey Keller is an independent photo historian, and for nearly two decades served as a photography curator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She's currently at work on a biography of photographic pioneer Anna Atkins. Corey served as an advisor to the film, and uh, for this credit, it's worth noting, uh, received her master's degree in art history from Stanford. Uh, Ryan Coffey is a senior staff scientist at uh, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory and a member of the Stanford Pulse Institute. Ryan studies super fast chemical motion, something I had never heard of before called femtochemistry. And I'm going to have Ryan explain that to you in a minute. Uh, so I'll start with Ryan. I want to pick up where we left off here. What I'm going to do is ask, we'll talk for a little bit, and then I'll open up the floor to questions from the audience if, you, if you'd like to ask a few questions. Um, I want to start where the film leaves off with Myridge's legacy. One of the things that really struck me during my research was uh, the many ways that Mybridge was uh, influential in fields I didn't expect to find one of them being femtochemistry, which is how I found Ryan, who generously gave me a tour of Slack at one point during my research. And as we were walking down a hallway, I think it's the big first hallway in the facility. Yeah, the first undulate era. Yeah, there's a, a picture hall. of one of Mybridge's uh, horse uh, sequences hanging on the wall there with an explanation. So uh, it gives you some sense. So why don't we start by, Ryan, let me ask you, what is femtochemistry <laughs> and what does it have to do with Edward Mybridge? Well, it's a really interesting line that tracks through history. Um, Moybridge, of course, sort of s created this world of capturing motion by taking freeze frame photography. In turn, inspired Doc Edgerton, who ended up producing some of the next generation of electronics for taking freeze frame, frame photography, used in fact to image some of the initial tests uh, in the Manhattan Project. And so you then have this connection to the International Atomic Agency, which SLAC originally was created as the high energy particle physics lab that was birthed from that project. And then Project M, and then it became SLAC, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And what, re what I love the most when we were talking about this, I take photographs of molecules freeze frame photographs of molecules as they move when you trigger them you start the clock with the laser so we're doing exactly the same thing that my bridge was doing so long ago just on a different time scale on the time scale that it takes these small molecules to vibrate we do it of course to figure out how energy moves through these molecules presumably he started with these horses for leland stanford to figure out how does how do the horses physiology move them through space we're trying to figure out how the structures of molecules move through time and energy. Wow, isn't that interesting? And uh, <laughs> give me a sense, just so people who've not seen Slack, just describe what this thing is So for people who don't have a sense. It's not a lot different than the initial um, camera that Mybridge used that was sort of this big, except this one now is, I think, t uh, two miles long. Yeah. No exactly. big deal, right? You just <laughs> <laughs> and how fast do the molecules move? If so my bridge was taking pictures at one five hundredth, one one thousandth, one two thousandths of a second. Uh, this is ten to the fifteen, which is a million million thousandths of a second. All right, all right. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> Excellent. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, Corey, if you could just pick up in the more predictable world of art. Uh, and photography. Um, what would you say his influence has been in, in photography, and is, are there examples beyond the ones that I list there? Uh, why don't I just sort of let me know sort of where he fits in this history of photography and how his legacy has influenced others? Honestly, we should talk more about the molecules, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's what's really interesting about Mybridge and, and all the 19th century photographers is how many times they sort of get rediscovered and reinvented. I mean, we tend to think about history as this long, continuous line, but in fact, photography um, has, has such a um, contested spot relative to other forms of art since its invention that it sort of comes in and out of the discussions at various points. And so, you know, it wasn't until the 19, uh, late 1920s um, 
when MoMA New York is founded in 1929, or SF MoMA in 1935, that art museums start even collecting photography as a form of, of art. Mm. Um, and so there's this constant desire to create a, a history. Um, you know, an ancestry. And so Mybridge kind of gets resuscitated mm -hmm. um, multiple times. So you see him, we were talking about how he's on the cover of Beaumont Newhall's famous, it's the first American, you know, history of photography in the centennial photography. And then um, he gets rediscovered again in the 60s by the conceptual artists who see in his sequences a kind of you know, a proto a proto conceptual artist um, that gives a kind of structure to the work they're already thinking about. So, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's so wonderful about this kind of work is how adaptable it is for various moments in time. Mm. So people go in search of their father and they find Edward Mybridge. That's a scary thought. <laughs> uh, Hopefully not. <laughs> uh, I'm curious what you think it is about Mybridge. As we saw those, the, at the end, the things go by. Is there anything that strikes you about his work, Corey, um, that stands out from an art perspective that is so influential? Why do people keep being moved by his story? I mean, I made a movie about him. I can talk about that. But I'm curious, from your point of view, what is it about him that inspires uh, not just artists, but innovators of all kinds? Well... One of the things, I mean, Mybridge was not alone in this field of people in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, who were trying to understand or to visualize things that couldn't be seen. Um, and so, you know, you see, have to see Mybridge against this background of all kinds of other things. They're trying to make pictures of electricity, of magnetism, forces that... And, you know, this is also the moment where all of a sudden we realize, oh, the world is not actually 5,000 years old and it wasn't made in seven days and holy moly, all the ideas that underpinned our idea of how we existed in the world are up for grabs. Um, and so Mybridge is making pictures of an, an imperceptible phenomenon. He's showing us the world as it exists but that we can't see. But unlike some of the other photographers who are trying to do this, who were making much more actually scientific photographs, to be honest, he turns them into pictures and he makes, he injects narrative and he injects human emotion into this work that makes them, um, I think, uh, affective, emotionally affective in a way that some of the other scientific pictures didn't always operate. And so they're easily graspable. Um, and they're enticing in so many ways. And they show us very concretely this idea that the world isn't the way we think it is. That's interesting. Do you have a thought, Ryan, about what makes him it's provocative? Actually, I think quite interesting because people think of science as being sort of stodgy and dry and no one really wants to invite the scientist to their house for a party. <laughs> but actually, it's a creative endeavor. And so to get your concepts across to the audience that explain some scientific phenomenon that we can't see with our eyes. Remember, this is happening right about as quantum mechanics is starting to explode. And that had ripples that, you know, there's this interesting interplay between art and some of the scientists that were early in quantum mechanics. This, and this idea of, you know, how do you capture the thing that doesn't make any logical sense at all? Quantum mechanics doesn't actually make sense. No one understands what it means. But it drives everything, so we don't know. Um, but that's where I think the art and the creativity that feed into science help tell the story. And you can't convey meaning unless you can identify with your audience. Mm. And so you have to tell stories with the way you represent your science. It's usually through imagery. And so you, we always thread this needle about how much art are we showing in our journal articles mm. versus how much explicit data. And the questions of bias come in and are some of us more artistic than we are scientistic? So I think a lot of the controversies still stand in science as a creative endeavor. But what I think is also interesting is that in the 19th century, in particular, that the fact that the materials would appeal to a general audience was not seen as a bug, but a, a feature. Yeah. You know, and so part of being a good citizen was to be educated about the, the scientific ideas of the day. So people used to go to lectures with slides. And so a lot of what Mybridge is doing with these illustrated lectures with the zoopraxiscope are part of an already established tradition of public scientific education. And if you want to get the 
general public to be interested in science, you have to make it kind of sexy and, right. and understandable. I mean, the, right. Hubble, the Hubble telescope does that. I mean, um, NASA does it today. Exactly. And one of the, so I study small molecules with spectrosco spectroscopy. Really, you don't want me to talk about that at your party. But the, the X-ray diffraction folks who are doing things like imaging the structure of the proteins that are on the outside of COVID, for instance, one of the things that you use this big two-mile-long machine to do, um, all of that is really geared toward the beautiful images. You, sh you put them in glossy journals so the public can see what these crystals look like and what the diffraction is. It's very inspiring, much like the night sky. So. But I love the idea of like the COVID, you know, the COVID virus. I mean, everybody here knows what a COVID virus looks like, right? But like when, when MyBridge is making these pictures, they still hadn't decided like what caused diseases. Yeah. You know, they're still bad air, you know, they were, they were still debate. They finally figured out like that half the reason women died during childbirth was because doctors didn't wash their hands. And once they figured out that if they washed their hands, they wouldn't die. Um, it was, I mean, so like the idea that you're taking pictures mm. of molecules, which weren't even, couldn't even be conceived of, um, is totally an extension of this yeah. principle. Exactly. Well, it's interesting because uh, you mentioned quantum mechanics and us not understanding quantum mechanics. And I, and yet, Believing it, <laughs> you know, some of us believe in it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just, I mean, like, like, so why do we believe it if we have? Uh, there's this interesting line Mybridge sort of rubs up against with Stanford that we talk about in the movie uh, about you know where what's true and the sort of Rodin versus Stanford point of view is it the human experience that matters or is there something beyond the human experience that we can measure that is true, and then how do we? I mean, we have a whole body of literature uh, going back hundreds of years about the fear of what our own creation sort of destroying us. And it's getting very hot right now, actually, <laughs> a lot of that, yeah. uh, for good reason, actually. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, where, where do you see that? How do you navigate that line between sort of, I guess, the subjective and can there, is there really an objective scientific point of view? So you're asking a tricky question because my first degree is in philosophy. So I actually... Buckle up, folks. I was just going to say <laughs> that this is a philosophy question. That's right. Um, so I don't believe in time or objective truth. So let's just get that, put that on the table immediately. Um, I got into this conversation with ChatGPT, actually, the other day. That's a good one. How do I know it's not sentient? I, I have no evidence that either of you are sentient. So I, I am... <laughs> A firm believer that the subjective reality is very high. And I believe that um, when I heard Brian Greene first give uh, a description, I didn't understand much of it, but of the holographic universe, the hair on the back of my neck just stood up that everything we perceive may just be perception. Perception may be the only truth there is. Um, and as such, it kind of freaked me out. But it turns out it might help quantum mechanics because... In a holographic universe, maybe the multi many worlds theory of quantum mechanics is okay. I don't know. Could explain it. Could make me feel more comfortable with it. So there's a lot to say about the perception that you get of something, whether it's quote-unquote factual or not, that perception carries the message. And the message is the thing that I think is more close to the truth. No, it was, first of all, we should check to make sure you don't have those matrix things on the back of your head. I do, um, I do. No, but I I'm think actually not real. <laughs> <laughs> that was how I prepared for this, was I watched the matrix again. Um, but I think what's super interesting about that is the way photography in the 19th century gets tangled up in this, because one of the reasons they keep talking about the machine not lying is one of the reasons people believe photography was true, because they didn't understand who actually was making the picture in the first place. Was it the machine, in mm -hmm. which case it can't be art, right? Because art is expression of human intelligence or emotion. Um, or is it the person behind the machine? And at the beginning, actually, they're pretty sure that it was God who was making those pictures because it was just the world magically transposed onto the, onto the photograph. And that was partly what gave it its authority. It was this sense it was just the world made its own picture. Um, and so there was this question about whether then did that represent the world. But of course, the early pictures, I mean, he was talking about the um, Guatemala landscape, the deluxe version. Yeah. 
Well, those mountains that he put back in, they were there, but they don't show up on a, on a 19th century emulsion because it's too sensitive to blue light. Mm -hmm. So it's not untrue, technically. He's trying to make it look the way it looked when he took the picture, but the picture doesn't show what he mm -hmm. saw. And the um, sky, was similarly, it can't record, you can't record the sky and the land in the same exposure and have them come out right. Mm -hmm. So you have to take two separate exposures, mm -hmm. one for the sky and one for the land, and that's why he, all those photographers had whole wardrobes of cloud photographs that they would <laughs> add in willy-nilly. And um, so it's a funny thing, because like, so it is what was in front of the lens, but half of it didn't record itself. So is that mm -hmm. actually the right picture, or was what he saw right? I mean, it becomes a very, um, it's, it's more of a philosophical question than a scientific one, I think, even well, in the 19th I century. Actually, completely disagree. I think it's absolutely a scientific <laughs> question, because I, literally just a day ago came out of a conference on cameras, scientific cameras that measure at multiple resolutions at the same time. And they do precisely that. They take multiple exposures of the same image because you can't capture, for them it's the dynamics of what they're trying to measure, but for us it's the human eye sees logarithmically. So we can see detail that you simply can't capture with the chemistry that you use to produce a photograph. And so what you do is you change your emulsion or you expose it for longer or shorter and you weave it together and you use your best judgment about what you're going to weave together. And scientists do this constantly. We just bake it into the microchip that's doing the, doing the weaving and we don't tell you about it. So you think it's true, but we're not doing much different than that. Uh, one last question before I open it to the audience. Do you, uh, what do you believe in a photograph? When you see a photograph, what do you believe? Good God. Uh, Not to put you on the spot. Uh, to put, put me on, okay. Being on the spot, when I see a photograph, it will evoke a, an emotion in me. And by logic, that's the only thing I think I can say I know is what it invokes in me. <laughs> that's tough to beat. I'm, I'm taking the fifth on this one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, can, yeah, can we open? Bring up some lights in the house, maybe, or at least can people s out there? I can't see anything except for a big white glow. Uh, so, uh, is, does anybody have a question? If you want to just raise your hands, uh, we have people standing over here with microphones. They can search you out and uh, take your question. And you can ask any one of us anything you'd like. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to hear uh, about the making of the film because it's such a true. When did you start it? And you know, just what what are your main recollections? Thank you for for the compliment. Uh, I started the film in 2012. Um, that was when I I first stumbled across Mybridge and uh, thought, oh, this guy's interesting, and uh, I like this guy's actually this is landscapes. I thought this guy. I was making another film about the history of of uh, the Jewish community of San Francisco. And uh, so I was getting early pictures of Mybridge, uh, of San Francisco, and they, for good reason, for obvious reason, turned out many of them to be by him. And they were the ones I always was gravitating towards and thought they were really interesting, and I didn't recognize the name. And then I punched in in Google, and then I recognized all the motion stuff and saw what a big deal he was. There were many books written about him and uh, thousands and thousands and thousands, countless, really, articles written about him. Uh, so I back grabbed one of the books, uh, this one by Rebecca Solnit, uh, who wrote a great book about Mybridge, and read it, and I was just blown away by what you saw, and thought, what a movie. This should be a movie. It shouldn't be a book. I mean, the books are fine. God bless him for writing books. But he's a visual artist, you know, and his work is completely lost in text. And, uh, and the books are printed on this shitty paper, and you know, there's a couple of pictures in there, and they, they're terrible. And uh, so I just thought it, it, it lent itself to a, a film. And the bigger idea is all the kind of deep thought that, you know, was, that he provoked. Uh, so I started the process then. And I finished it in 2021. And that's way too long. That should, no movie should take that long. But independent films are very tough to make, you know, mostly because you have to raise money. And the money raising takes a really, you can take and usually does take a really long time, and I, it took me many years, uh, and I ultimately raised the bulk of the funding 
from the National Endowment for Humanities, thankfully, after they rejected me several times. So uh, be resilient. That's my lesson. I took that from my bridge, actually. I just kept getting off, off the mat. And uh, one day you'll sit in front of an audience sharing a film. Uh, so there you go. And support government funding for the arts. Yes, there you go. Support the government. I, this is what you, your tax dollars paid for this. <laughs> okay. Tess. I, I don't know. I don't think this is on. I don't know if you know up this, here but... we have a, a, a question up here. Somewhere I'm being told? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, talk to me a little bit about, as you were um, putting the film together, your comparison between Mybridge, the artist, versus the man. I mean, there's a lot of controversy about, you know, was he, was he Ed Weird? I mean, he was, he, he had some ex... <laughs> was he crazy? Was he, you know... Um, but... Your, your focus seems to be much more on his art and, and how he um, threw out this film. So did, did you see a dichotomy between him as an artist and who he was as a personality? Uh, not particularly. I think, uh, you know, a question can get asked. I, I wondered what I asked you just a moment ago, what it is about his work that is uh, so alluring and so striking and draws me to it. Uh, there are, uh, there's a, a small, very small body of literature by uh, neurologists who've written a bunch about his head injury and how that could explain his personality and his uh, impulse control issues and, and the murder and things like that. Um, I was, I guess I was interested in you know, I'm not an art historian. I, I'm, I don't know that. I don't. I don't have a formal education in that. And I came to this story. My background is as a journalist, a long-form documentary journalist, and uh, so I was drawn to him as a sort of means of understanding who we are, his story. Um, and then when I found when I when I really I, I I mean I read early on that he was you know manipulating his photog photographs the 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 Modoc warrior story is pretty well known and gets written about usually, um, but the more I learned about his manipulations and and who they served, uh, the more they spoke to me as a as a a journalist who's struggled with these issues for a long time like 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 you have as in science which is. You know, we, you talk about we know what we see or we only know what we experience. Well, we are your eyes. And uh, th there's a lot of power embedded in that role. And honestly, it's not always used honestly. And it's not always used uh, productively. And I've struggled with that over the course of my career. Uh, and uh, so when that issue rose in Mybridge's work, it touched all my buttons and, and you know every story is personal on some level and so I that's my imprint on, on his story that's what led me so directly to telling it that way and setting up as a to have a third act of reveals about his level of trustworthiness if you want to call it that um, so I was you know it's funny because as a someone who specializes in 19th century photography when I saw the thing about the moment I'm like yeah of course he did that. I mean, of course, they're m manipulated. It was totally not shocking to me because that's so part and parcel of photography. <laughs> well, it's this idea we have, and that's what's interesting to examine is where do we get this idea, actually, that photographs tell the truth? They've been manipulated since 1839, um, just and, and not in a nefarious kind of way, actually. I mean, I think I would answer your question about the man versus the artist. I mean, I'm going to be controversial and offend everybody and say that Mybridge is neither an artist nor a scientist. Um, he's a picture maker, and that's different. It's different. Um, and where you get the sense of, I mean, every body of work that he made from his landscapes to his motion pictures were done for an audience an audience that was going to buy the pictures. That's really important. So he needs to make pictures that those people want to buy. So he has to be thinking about what they're interested in. Um, and what a thing I think is super important about thinking about a man versus a, or I would use author. I'm gonna use the word author because artist to me implies a kind of uh, expression of some kind of subjective or emotional experience rather than, and I don't really think that's what he's doing. Um, 
he starts off by giving himself the name Helios. That's not immodest at all, right? He's going to call himself the god of the sun to start it off. And this is a way of claiming authorship, right? Because he's going to say, my camera doesn't make the, the picture, or the sun doesn't make the picture. I am the sun god. I make the pictures. And I'm going to write that. If you look at his pictures, he's written his name on rocks, on trees, in every one of his pictures. And he brands them. If that's not enough, he puts himself in the picture over and over and over again um, from the very beginning. Um, and this like crafting of a persona um, to Eduardo Santiago Mybridge, to Edward Mybridge. I mean, he takes the name of the Saxon king. I mean, this guy is no lack of ego. <laughs> but over and over again, he is insisting, I made these pictures. I made these pictures. I am the author, not the machine, not the sun, not God. Um, and I think that that's where we get a real sense of, I don't think he was crazy at all. I think he was a really sly, um, savvy, um, catering to his audience and to a market. Um, and he knew what they wanted and what to sell them. Are we, sci are we scientists not also catering to a market? I mean, we certainly don't have ego. That's for sure. Do you sure. need funding? <laughs> <laughs> do, you need, do you need funding? Precisely. Yeah. We have our audience. We know who pays the bills. Now, our hope is that we're not expressing an internal subjective experience of the world. We're trying to convey information which can be built into something useful for humanity. Right? That's our goal. But to get it funded, you tell a little story. So, He who pays the piper calls the tune. Uh, I, I, it's interesting to, to hear you talk about uh, he, his, his sort of his motives, I guess. His motive, in my view, his motive was to become famous. Uh, he wanted to be known. And he kept trying different things, and they, didn't, they worked okay. So he was a decent book publisher, businessman in San Francisco on Montgomery Street for a while. Um, his other sort of endeavors uh, uh, didn't turn out well. But I'm always... I, I, I'm struck by the fact that after he produces this incredible motion study in Pennsylvania in the late 1880s, there's no other photograph by Mybridge left on record. There's nothing left after that. He lives for another 15 years, and he doesn't take any more pictures, uh, as far as we know. He continues giving these small little lectures in like libraries in, in, in London and in, in his hometown of Kingston and around Europe and even a couple in the United States. And I, I do, I wonder why he stopped. And all I can think of is that he became convinced people didn't want to see what he made anymore. And he made it for them, not for himself. Or he made it for the, the accolades that they gave him. And also to make a buck. When you see these, um, photographers in those days would sell their work by publishing prospectuses, right? You can't. Because people bought the pictures without seeing what they were actually buying. It was based on the reputation of the photographer and based on the reputation of the other people who had already bought the material. So he would publish a prospectus, say, buy my work. And this is a list of all the people who have bought copies already. He did that, yeah. He, d he did do that, yes. And he also, you know, in the day, back in the day, and maybe this was common, but I know this about him, is that uh, news articles in the paper were not uh, authored. They didn't have a signature. And there would be these uh, florid uh, sort of descriptions of, you know, Mybridge, the most brilliant photographer, returns from his trip to Yosemite with the most extraordinary pictures ever taken of this magical valley. Nothing's ever been seen like... And he wrote these all <laughs> and placed them in, in, the, in the newspaper. Now, that's marketing. Okay, you know. Well, he also had, he had a rival, Carlton Watkins, who yeah. he, I mean, he was also having to... Watkins had already established himself as the premier photographer of Yosemite. So, you know, Mybridge has to go in there and he's, it's, it's a crowded market already, so he has to distinguish himself. And so he's like, well, you know, Watkins not sitting out on rocks looking like a crazy, I'm going to go, I mean, so he really, and he really advertised the daring acts that he did in order to make these pictures. I mean, that part may be a little crazy, but. Uh. All right, is there another question out there? Up in a balcony, we have something. Okay. 
You realize I see nothing but light. Right. Oh, I know. I don't know. Is the mic on? Yeah, it is. Okay, so this is a much more mundane question. You mentioned Carlton Watkins, who also had a very tragic life in San Francisco. He did not own all the copyrights to his photographs, so it, people impersonated and published um, under their own names. Did um, uh, Mybridge own the copyright to his photographs? And secondly, um, I noticed that the uh, books are still are not out of print. Who is the benefactor of um, those? those funds that would be generated from the book sales? Well, the work now is in the public domain, so the publisher is the, is the uh, benefit, <laughs> is the yeah. benefits. But um, yeah, Watkins, uh, Watkins sold all of his pictures to Tabor, who then reissued his photographs under their own name without crediting him. And then he went and re-photographed everything under his own name called the New Series um, and sold them again under his own name. Um, my bridge, it seems to have retained the copyright for his own work. I mean, you can see he writes copyright, my bridge. Yeah, he copyrights everything. And he, get the, he got the copyright from Stanford as part of his deal, Leland Stanford as part of his deal to take the photographs. Stanford gave him the copyright for a dollar, um, which became the basis. This is not, I didn't explain this in the film. I didn't tell the story. But uh, after my bridge is betrayed by Stanford, he sues him uh, and loses. And his case, his, uh, it's, a, it's a little unclear to me why he sues him. On the, he sues him for, like, uh, uh, reputational harm, uh, which is, in a way, very Mybridge. Like, what's he care about? He cares about what people think about him. So what's he sue the guy for? He sues him for, you know, making him look bad. When he should have sued him for copyright infringement, which he didn't sue him for, which he had all the copyrights. So I don't know, you know, I, that's a mystery to me. I didn't tell in the story, so I didn't get deeper into it. But nonetheless, that's that's that. Um, we got time maybe for another I question. I have one or two. one question back here. Um, okay. In the yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, I just oh, this, have to this, do is this. A, this is a simple question. Why don't we know how to pronounce his last name? <laughs> It's a made-up name. I mean, he, he, he made it up. But the, I will just say that English people say Mybridge. And since he was English, that's the way I've always gone. Because it's, in England, it's pronounced Mybridge. But yeah, it's a made-up name. So you can call him whatever you want. <laughs> and there was no sound recording at the time. To, they, or at least he didn't record his sound saying his name. So who knows how he wants it said. All right, one for, more? What, Anybody else have more? something? Are we done? Oh, oh, we've got no, some up got here. One, uh, one up here in the front. Here, I have a quick one uh, about uh, how did you get Gary Oldman involved, and did he have any any initial interest in it? Because it sort of seems like he did. Yeah, that's a good question because we did. I uh, when we str I struggled a little bit with how to. You know, I didn't narrate the film, and so, as you know, so when you don't, when you remove narration as a, a tool. Uh, it, it's quite limiting. Uh, f first of all, you have to interview uh, certain kinds of people to tell the story um, because they have to be uh, completely familiar with his biography so they can tell you what happened next if you're doing a biography. And when you have narration to work with, you can tell the story and you can use your interview subjects for other reasons like you know, reactions or feelings or opinions or whatever. Uh, and this was something I couldn't quite figure out how to tell you about Gary Oldman without like creating a, 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 a title identifier that was like four lines long. He wrote a screenplay about Edward Mybridge that he was hoping to make into a film. And that's how I found out about him. And right around the same time I started making my film, I saw a very short item that Gary Oldman was going to make a film called The Flying Horse about, Gar about Mybridge. He had written the screenplay. He was going to direct it. It was going to star Ray Fiennes and Benedict Cumberbatch and himself <laughs> and uh, Amanda Seyfried as Flora. And so I kind of tucked it away in my research and thought, oh, you know, when time comes and I have the money and I'm doing interviews, maybe I should try to interview him. Uh, he wrote a screenplay. That's what I've seen. He probably knows, he'll know the story and he will tell it well. And so by the time the, the I had collected my money many years down the road. I had already met with uh, a, a number of different collectors and made notes of private collectors of who had what kinds of interesting artifacts I might want to film. And one group was one collector was in San Francisco and he had some nice stuff. And I went back to him and said, 
hey, okay, we got our money. We're going to start filming now. I'd like to film those objects you showed me. And he said, oh, I, I sold those. <laughs> and I said, ah, okay. And I said, well, who'd you sell them? I can't tell you. I can't tell you who I told them to sell them to. That's, that's private information. But uh, if you guess, I, 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 will, I will confirm. <laughs> And he's a well-known, he's a pretty well-known guy uh, in Southern California. I said, Gary Oldman? Yes, it was him. <laughs> and uh, so now I had two reasons I could approach Oldman. One was his interest in his collection and the other himself. But I still had to get to him. I, 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 uh, you can't reach celebrities through, by calling their agent or you know, trying to get to them through a front door unless you're carrying a huge bag of cash that you're promising to pay them. Uh, so it's just very, very tough to reach people like that. And um, I tried through the front door for a while because that's all I had and that went nowhere and then eventually found somebody who had his email. Uh, and I started emailing him to no, got no reaction. And uh, after about my fourth email maybe, he, a couple weeks later I got an email back from him and he'd been off filming Mank and was off the grid uh, and so we had a conversation. He was very warm, and he was super interested in MyBridge. Uh, his project had kind of died by then. He hadn't been able to raise the money. Um, and, uh, and he agreed to be interviewed. He, I can't remember if I, I think I asked to come down and see his collection first, and he allowed me to come down and see his collection. I might have asked him already to be interviewed, but I might have asked him later to, if he would sit for an interview. And he agreed. And, and all those pictures you see uh, that we shot ourselves are from his collection. If you notice, there's several images that you can see pa the paper or the edge. They're all landscapes. Um, and those were uh, from his collection. He let us spend a couple of days with our cameras and lenses shooting his stuff. And I had hoped to do more of that kind of shooting with the motion s sequences, but um, I had trouble getting access to some of that, and then COVID hit, and uh, all the institutions in these, the big motion sequences are mostly, well, they're all actually in institutions. I don't think, I, I don't know of a single individual collector who has the whole Pennsylvania album. Um, I found one in San Francisco who's quite well known, um, and he had, I don't know, 140 of them. Yeah, he has, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, so he has a lot of them, but he didn't have the whole thing. Uh, and the pandemic shut everything down, and I was sort of running out of money at that point, and you start sort of balancing how to, how to finish. So, so that's how I got Gary. I asked and asked and asked and asked and asked, and that's usually how you get people like that to appear in movies for free. So thanks to all of you for coming out. It's a real joy to be able to share the film with you. Thanks to both of you. Our pleasure.